right. Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all. This is our last class of the series, and so I'm glad you all made it to the end. We'll go ahead and start with setting our motivation using refuge in bodhicitta. Sangge chudon sugi chunam hai janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yengi pe sonam ki drona penche sangge drupa sho sangge chudon sugi chunam ha janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yengi pe sonam ki I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Just connecting with that. Okay, so if you can, pop your video on, and if you can't, that's okay. Um, we've been talking mostly about the movement of the mind, the mental factors. We've been talking a lot about how each of the mental factors get conditioned in different ways, and because of that conditioning or habituation, sometimes it feels like we don't have control, sometimes it feels like we're very powerless about how much happiness we can have in our life. But by studying minds and mental factors and looking at these topics more deeply, I think is a really helpful way to empower ourselves to take control over the aspects of our situation where it's possible and then to kind of let go the areas where it's not yet possible. So we're not hitting our head against the wall, but we're also not being passive or complacent. So understanding the mechanisms of the mind, I think is one of the richest subjects, but we wanna make sure that we're coming at it from not just an intellectual perspective, but really applying it to your own mind specifically as an individual. So, um, I'll review a little bit from last week, and then we're gonna move into looking at the main minds, the primary consciousnesses, and looking a little bit at the difference between conception and perception. And I got some questions via email about this, and thank you very much for sending them. Um, the quick answer is, and we'll elaborate, but the quick answer is that conception and perception shouldn't be seen as one good, other bad. Okay, I think that's a very common misconception is to think if it's perceptual, it must be a realization, it must be good. We have all sorts of perceptions that are completely faulty. And then the other mistake I hear is that if it's conceptual, it's lower and less and mistaken and not useful and to be avoided at all costs, stop thoughts immediately <laughs> as if you could. And it's through conception that we condition the mind in a positive way and are actually able to achieve realizations which become direct perceptions. So we need the conceptual mind. Our work is in the conceptual mind for a huge part of our life, a huge part of our lifetimes, the practice in general. So don't put down conception, you need it. And also don't think you can escape it. Too bad it's coming whether you like it or not. Okay, so that's the short, version of um, the answer to some of the questions I was getting, and we'll dive more into it in a sec. All right, so first review. Um, last week, we were finishing up with the mental factors, and the ones we were looking at most specifically were these four variable mental factors, sleep, regret, investigation, and analysis. And in and of themselves, the four variable factors are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, but become so in dependence on our motivation and other mental factors that accompany that same mental state. So sleep isn't good or bad, but it becomes positive or negative, beneficial or destructive based on what other mental factors accompany it. Similarly regret, investigation and analysis. So I think that when we're looking at the mental factors, particularly those variable mental factors, there's something similar with the main minds. 
So similar to the variable mental factors, main minds are also not positive or negative in and of themselves, but they become so in dependence upon what other mental factors accompany them. So the five primary consciousnesses, the five main minds, I'm gonna use those interchangeably, they are all perceptual in the sense of direct, but not necessarily accurate, due to their conditioning from self-grasping. And then you get mental primary consciousness and mental primary consciousness can be conceptual or perceptual. So we're over on the main mind's primary consciousness side and uh, we looked at the mental factors in a fair amount of detail. But when you see two big lumps of categories, don't mentally separate them too much because it's all consciousness. We're just looking at different facets of experience. Okay, so perceptual versus conception. So perception engages in its object positively by affirmation, as opposed to conception, which engages in its object negatively by elimination. It's kind of something interesting to sit with. Perception engages in its object as it is without exaggerating. Conception does not engage in the object as it is. There's gonna be a mistaken component even if it's accurate from a worldly perspective. Perception engages in the quote real object, meaning the actual object perceived by worldly convention Whereas conception does not engage in a real object, it more engages with a snapshot in our mind, which is sometimes called a generic image or a meaning generality. And it's kind of like you took one moment in time and said, that's what a cup is, or that's what a rock is, or that's what a good person is. And now everything that seems to fulfill that criteria gets plugged into that picture. So it's something a bit static that you're relating to, as opposed to perception, which is engaging in the real object. Perception is generally very accurate in a general sense. Conception is always mistaken because it's conditioned by grasping at inherent existence. Perception is also conditioned by grasping at inherent existence, but it's not as trapped. It doesn't provide any integrative content and conception does provide integrative content. So when you're looking at these two side by side, it's, it's a little tricky to understand the way in which they kind of collaborate or combine or take turns having prominence or what exactly is going on there. So we're gonna go into it a bit more, but it's important to understand that main minds and mental factors have the same basis, they depend on the same cognitive faculty. They share the same observed object. They apprehend the same object. They're directed in the same way. Both are generated in the same aspect of the object. They reflect a similar aspect of the object. They occur at the same time, arise, abide, cease simultaneously. And they are the same entity each mental state consists of only one primary mental consciousness, or excuse me, primary consciousness, and only one of each of its accompanying mental factors. Furthermore, the primary mind and all its accompanying mental factors are either conceptual or non-conceptual, mistaken or unmistaken. So what we're really saying with this group of five is that mains and my minds and mental factors are directed at the same thing at the same time and are just looking at different aspects of whatever is quote in front of them. So there's two types of primary mind or main mind, sensory primary minds and mental primary minds. The sensory primary minds are fivefold, namely visual, audio, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile primary minds. Each of these five are defined according to their dominant condition, the particular sense organ in dependence upon which they occur. They are mutually exclusive states of consciousness, each being accompanied by their own sets of mental factors. Sensory primary minds are exclusively perceptions. 
whereas mental primary minds can either be perceptual or conceptual. Both categories are likewise able to, dis to distinguishable into true and false, ideal and non-ideal. So this is important to understand. Main minds and mental factors could be true or false. Conception and perception could be true or false. It's impossible to have a primary mind and its mental factors belonging to a substantially distinct and mutually exclusive categories of cognition. So if the I primary consciousness is looking at a person, then it's not like the mental factors are looking at a tree, right? They're doing the same kind of focus. They're directed in the same way. And also, if you're looking at a person with mental factors of love, then the main mind becomes associated or conditioned by love. It can't suddenly be angry and loving at the same time. That's not how the mind works. So both conceptual and non-conceptual consciousnesses have their advantages and disadvantages in daily life and in Dharma practice. Perceiving objects directly give us information about the immediate environment around us. However, these direct perceivers cannot remember these objects, nor can they relate to one object to another to invent new items, plan how to use things, or remember our previous experience with them so that we can apply what we learned to what we will do now. Thought enables us to do all this. However, the price we pay with thought is that the conceptual appearance is a conflation of objects at different times in different places or with different characteristics. Okay, so I think an easy way to understand the difference between main minds and mental factors is to kind of think about maybe the way in which you come into a new place with an open mind, um, perhaps you're traveling or visiting. And when you come to a new place, there's something kind of open about the way you view things. You haven't decided if the landscape is beautiful or not, but you're aware of landscape. You haven't decided if the town is cute and quaint or if it's run down and destitute just yet. Later, you're going to have opinions about it. Beautiful scenery, you know, I don't know, low socioeconomic status. You're going to come in with all sorts of opinions down the track. But initially, it's kind of like we're in a main mind modality, even though technically a lot more is going on. Just kind of think of when you're able to see the bareness of something. So it's not like you're blank and it's not like you're passive. You just haven't gotten a lot of words in there yet. You know, or a bit like um, you can picture an old person on a porch with a, in a rocking chair, just kind of watching the world go by, not necessarily deciding anything in particular about what they see. That kind of like open, expansive awareness is more akin to the way main minds function. Mental factors are the busy part, the descriptive part the choosing part of consciousness. They're engaging with things, they're helping you remember things, they're looking for patterns, they're storing information. So the mental factors are detail oriented and a lot more movement, which is why we use that analogy of the main minds being like the sky and the mental factors being like the clouds or like weather coming and going. So, really don't think that they're happening at different times. You always have a primary consciousness that is dominant. And with that is always the five omnipresent mental factors and probably miscellaneous other ones as well. Yeah, so you always have a main mind kind of like holding the generality of something, either visually or auditory or taste. And for us, it kind of seems like we're able to have all of our sense consciousnesses operating simultaneously, but it's more like they take turns being dominant. And we're kind of rotating through what is emphasized. So sometimes what is heard is emphasized to our mind. Sometimes what is seen is emphasized to our mind, right? We're kind of flicking through them. 
And because of our samsaric mind, our attached mind, it's almost like we're trying to get the senses to give us entertainment. So we cycle through them until one of them is fun. Right, so you look at something until you're bored, then you, I don't know, eat something until you're bored, and then you listen to something until you're bored, and you're just kind of like cycling through your senses, trying to get them to be fun for you. Yeah, that's kind of how we are, right? Um, on a bad day, on a normal day, I don't know. But when you're looking at how the main minds operate, really think about the way in which the mental factors color them. So for example, you might be looking at your closest, dearest friend. And your closest, dearest friend might have a very ordinary face, not conventionally beautiful, not conventionally ugly, just kind of a regular person face, right? But because you love them, they are beautiful to you. And not just in a kind of like, I don't know, imagined way or a kind of dreamy hippie way, they literally look beautiful to you. Like that one weird wrinkle is very endearing and that wonky eye is really sweet, right? There's something about the actual visual apprehension when it's conditioned by love that actually is very beautiful to you. Do you know what I mean? Right, maybe the opposite is easier to understand. Like if you really dislike someone, even if they're beautiful, they're ugly to you. And you're like annoyed at their symmetrical face, stupid symmetry, right? <laughs> So, so really think about like your main mind operating in that moment is the I primary consciousness, but the omnipresent mental factors are saying, I like, I don't like, come closer, go far away, hold still, get away. All sorts of movement is happening together with I primary consciousness being dominant. And then you might flick you know, very quickly, right? Mental moments are so quick. You might switch over into ear primary consciousness being dominant as they speak. And if you love them, the sound of their voice is pleasant to you. And if you hate them, the sound of their voice is unpleasant to you. Do you know this experience, right? Especially when it's a very strong mental factor, right? For you know, everyday life, we might not have such kind of visceral experiences with the way our senses are connecting with things, but it is interesting to look at it that way. So main minds, expansive, reflected, reflective, not opinionated, mental factors, very opinionated, very moving. Um, conception is indirect, perception, direct. So you're either getting at the object in a positive way, or you're getting at an object in a by negation way. And you know, since it's a short course, we don't have a ton of time to go into the details of that, but I really do recommend that um, series by His Holiness and Tupton Children. The second book is um, what, The Foundation of Buddhist Practice, and it really talks about this dichotomy in a very interesting way. But um, so far, neuroscientists aren't necessarily breaking it down so specifically, but I think there is movement in understanding that as well. So are there some questions so far or just some thoughts that are bubbling up? Um, I was just thinking um, with mental factors. I missed a couple of classes. Uh, uh, but just thinking in terms of mental factors, um, is that the only place, let's say, where attraction and aversion can come about and that the main mind is just, uh, quote unquote, pure in the sense that, like you said, non-opinionated. Uh, yeah, yeah. So attachment and aversion or, uh, yeah, attraction and aversion, as you put it, um, they would go under the mental factors of destructive mental factors or constructive mental factors. Yeah, if you could kind of give them a big heading like that. So mental factors, it's not like they're true or false as a category. The specific ones are accurate or inaccurate, destructive or productive. So when we're talking about the omnipresent mental factors, the object determining mental factors, and the variable mental factors, those are very much dependent on other things to make them positive or negative. Same with the main minds. It needs other mental factors to make them positive or negative. So you plug in non-attachment or you plug in anger has a very different coloring to the affect of the mind. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it is really helpful to use your memories for this of how strange it is for an appearance to your mind to shift with time. Even if the person hasn't particularly changed, your relationship changing, your heart changing makes the look of them change. Yeah, or makes the experience with them change. It's, it's very interesting. And, you know, we can use all of our training in understanding the lack of inherent existence to then facilitate that in a proactive way, right? Rather than being passive about it, we can say, wouldn't it be nice if everyone seemed beautiful to my mind and everybody's words felt pleasant to my ears and all tastes were experienced blissfully? Wouldn't it be nice? How do I make that happen? Ah, color it with a positive state of mind. Yeah, it kind of giving it, um, you know, a nice Instagram filter, but a healthy one. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's actually closer to the reality. Yeah, Laran, go ahead. Yes. Um, I have a, a, not a problem, but I can't really uh, go to a heap of it. I, I, I think, like, I imagine that some somebody like, Imagine some someone is uh, unconscious or on drug, uh, and it seems everything is beautiful and everything is like <laughs> yeah. they are distant from the reality, kind of. So, um, is it um, the um, your pr primary mind as it, it, it it's like a sky, and the mental factors are the one that tells you that uh, tell you that it's not good it's bad or it, and somehow it's very uh, negative but sometimes when uh, you are on meditation and you have your distance from all these mental factors everything seems more calm or beautiful i don't know is, is it right well, it's not like you're getting rid of or distancing yourself from mental factors. It's more like your mental factors are chilling out and they're less chatty and they're not causing so much trouble. They're still actively present, the five omnipresent ones particularly. And then in meditation, very much the object ascertaining ones are engaged a lot, but they're gentler and they're quieter and they're conditioned with the motivation you had at the beginning of the meditation. You know, so what you've done is given yourself potentially the fertilization and watering of positive karmic seeds, which then will ripen as happiness during your meditation session. But there's no guarantee because you don't have control over all of the conditions watering all of the seeds that you're experiencing in any given moment. One of the biggest conditions for old karmic seeds to ripen is your current mental state but there are other things going on as well and your current mental state is not like consistently happening in a long-term way. It's changing, 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 changing. So you might've had a good motivation, then a distracted motivation, then an egocentric motivation, all within 30 seconds. So which seeds got watered, right? So in the case of someone who is high, they have watered some positive karmic seeds, but they're creating negative karmic seeds. So they're having a great time wearing out their positive karma because it's blissful and fun. And they're probably creating negative karma because of attachment to that experience. Unless they're in one of those very nice trips that is all very altruistic and we're all one and it's one of those kind of groovy trips. Maybe it's not so bad. You'd have to take it case by case. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> um, Roxy? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Um, that's hilarious. I. Is the ideal to color our mental factors in this in the same sort of reflective, expansive, unopinionated light as our main mind? Or are we in a way ideally trying to cultivate a more positive emotion? Like you said, it would be um, wouldn't it be nice if we could see or feel everybody as being beautiful and we could sort of filter them through um, you know, color, color our, our mental factors with positive emotions. Um, and, and then I started to doubt, does, is that a little bit like liking 
disliking, you know, or being neutral, it's sort of appending a judgment. Yeah, no, is I know what you mean. Get non judgmental. Did you know what I mean? A little bit? Yeah, I do. It's okay. like, um, by preferring a pleasant experience, isn't that part of the problem? And yet the pleasant experience is often, you know, conditioned by things that are loving kindness and compassion, which are very positive and to be sought after. So what we're trying to do is use the mind training technique of thinking, whatever happens, happiness or suffering, may I take it as fuel for the path? And that gives me an inner satisfaction, whatever is the case. And then you wind up being happier and more peaceful more of the time, but you're not upset if that's not happening because it's still facilitating the process that you've invested in. Yeah, so you do want to be happy. You do want to be blissful. You're not pretending that that's not part of your motivation in cultivating positive states of mind, but you're knowing that in such a way that you can manage it and adjust it to as much altruism as you can without self-deception, without spiritual bypassing. So, you know, it's a delicate dance, but definitely we're trying to train the mind to be happier. <laughs> we are, but the, the relationship between a happy mind and a kind mind is very direct. Like how much easier is it to be kind when you're happy? How much easier is it to be unkind when you're unhappy, right? The correlation is very much there. So I guess the, the, the issue becomes one of dominance, which, which kind of motivation is dominating you? Is it just bliss seeking or is it happy in order to be of greatest benefit? Oh, that sounds like a new like coffee mug or t-shirt slogan. The relationship between a kind mind and a happy mind is direct. I love that. Thank you. Probably is on a coffee mug somewhere. I'm just full of cliches. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's one of these things where even though it's basic, it is so true. And all you need is to just scratch back into some of those memories of, wow, I was so nice that day. I was so expansive. I was so accommodating. I was so loving. Oh, and I was really happy. <laughs> Chicken or the egg, you know? Was I happy first and then expansive or was I expansive and then that made me happy? And you don't really have to figure out the chicken or the egg if your whole process is, may I be of benefit to all sentient beings? All sentient beings include me. I'm not separate from sentient beings that I'm working for the welfare of. Having that intention is, you know, giving me some sort of meaning and fulfillment in the deep contentment way. Even if there's like surface stress and surface worries and various health issues or discomforts, it's kind of easier for it to fade to the background because you have kind of a, an alignment of your focus. So, you know, so when you're thinking about these different ways of conditioning the mind, it really helps to unpack a lot of just everyday conventions about what we think is true, which just isn't, which isn't even going into the lack of inherent existence. It's many steps before that. But concepts like beauty, you know, is very useful for us to look at because we have a general idea of what society thinks is beautiful. But then if we think about who is the beautiful people in our life, they're just regular folks, right? Some of them have symmetrical features, some of them do not, right? And to really break down all of these things that we're being told in society are just trying to get us to buy stuff. So, you know, don't believe it. And how much fashion changes and how much body image stuff changes. I. I tell this story all the time, some of you have heard it, but there was the time I had the cold and I was in Australia and I bought the cold medicine and it was next to the skin tanner and the diet pills. And then I went to India a couple days later with the same cold pre-COVID, right? <laughs> and I went and got the cold medicine at the pharmacy and it was next to skin bleaching and weight gaining powder, right? <laughs> and I thought, all right, in one culture being, tan and thin in another culture being heavy and white what is beauty whatever right whatever's going to sell products or whatever is going to indicate wealth right so if you've got the time to get skinny and tan that must mean you're wealthy if you've got the time to get fat and pale that must mean you're wealthy but it depends on the culture nonsense all of it we know that right we know that but it's nice to see it right in front of your face 
and to realize the absurdity of things. And so when we look at ourself in the mirror, do we have a pleasant affect, right? Do we think, hey, not so bad, right? Or do we think, oh, does not fulfill societal standards, therefore I should be punished by self-hatred and that will somehow lead me to the promised land, right? We have all these weird ideas like, we're trying to get ourselves to look a certain way because that will make us worthy of love or acceptance when plenty of people love us any old way, right? The immediate appearance of people is only really relevant for what, like the first 20 seconds and then no one cares, right? The first 20 seconds you're like, huh, that's what you look like, right? <laughs> but then after that, who cares, yeah? especially as you get older, right? It's different when you're adolescent, but you know, we, we're grownups now, we know better now, but we remember it on purpose. So these ways of conditioning the mind, you have to hit it from a lot of different angles. But I think um, there was a cute kid story that was trying to explain how to do this and they put it in a very simple way. And they said, imagine your mind is like a glass of pure water and that the mental factors are like food coloring. And so just one little drop colors the whole glass of water. What color do you want it to be? Do you want it to be the color of love? Do you want it to be the color of hate, right? But it can only really be one color at a time. And that's how the mind functions. You can't be loving and angry in the same exact moment. So what's your little dropper full of? All right, so I'll keep going a little bit and then um, jump in if you've got thoughts. Okay, so conception, right? Conceptual consciousnesses lack the vividness and clarity of direct perceivers. Hearing the sounds of Dharma teachings on impermanence or seeing the black squiggles in a book about this topic involve non-conceptual direct perception with our auditory and visual consciousnesses. Understanding and contemplating the meanings of these sounds and squiggles are done by conceptual consciousnesses. After we realize impermanence through inference with the conceptual consciousness, we continue meditating until we break through the conceptual appearance and perceive impermanence directly and non-conceptually. This realization is more profound. So this is a very fundamental point in Buddhism, which is if you think about it enough with thoughts, with conception, with words, it will eventually color your mind all the time if it's a positive state of mind. So it's through that very repetition that something that took effort becomes effortless. And then all of your thoughts become colored automatically by those realizations. So you take impermanence like the example, and you've heard the fact that things change, right? There are permanent things and impermanent things. The impermanent things change moment to moment, categories, subcategories, right? Con we've got form, consciousness, non-associated composites, all of that changes moment to moment. We can hear and understand that. We can think about it a great deal. Then we meditate on it. And then what? You do it again. <laughs> and you do it again, and you do it again until you don't have to remember it on purpose, you remember it spontaneously, and you don't even have to call back a memory, it's just spontaneously there after a fashion. So the learning process that we know just from the brain is very similar to main mind's conditioning. Yeah, so when we want to condition a main mind, we've got to give it healthy mental factors again and again, until it becomes imbued with that always. Yeah. So how do you know if you've had a realization of bodhicitta? Well, you don't have to stop and think about it. It's always present in every other moment. Going to the grocery store, driving the car, having a conversation, doesn't matter. It's already colored. It's pre-colored by bodhicitta. Yes, Ned, go ahead. Thank you, Venerable. I just wanted um, to understand, you know, this idea where we say that our understanding, which is conceptual, becomes perceptual. Is, yeah. Like, is there an example of trying to even, un like, that I could relate to? Like, it just seems like everything, I, I either see it or I think about it. 
but I don't know how thinking becomes seeing. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of examples. Lots of people use music examples. Um, I was thinking, trying to think of other examples the other day, and I was remembering um, when I was a kid and I used to play basketball, and the coach would drill us in these formations again and again and again, the drilling and the drilling. You pass to them, you pass to them, you pass to them, you pass to them, and it was just this constant drilling. And then game after game with that same formation, eventually you got into kind of a flow state with your teammates where you didn't have to think on purpose, I must pass to Sally and then she will pass to Jessica and then they will make the a basket. You didn't have to like work it out step by step in your mind. It was just like flow, flow, flow and just happened. But it couldn't just magically happen that way. You had to have reinforced it with all of that drilling. You know, so similarly with practicing music again and again, then you can go off book, then you can almost go off memory where you don't have to even see the notes in your mind's eye while you're playing, you just play it. Mm -hmm. But it's not a magic ability, it's born from conditioning. Does that, does that help? Yeah, because you reminded me of an example that I, I had forgotten that I can relate to, which is martial arts. Mm. You know, and, and that is what I used to do and I love. I'm a huge martial arts fan. So that is totally an example I get. Drilling, drilling, that's what happens. going slow. Yeah, you can't think. Like in the moment, you can't think. Exactly. And it only works if you did a lot of thought first. <laughs> yeah. You, you, yes. Yeah. So, Thank I mean, we, we all have examples, but I mean, even just the ability to read as adults, you know, is born from all that repetition we did as kids. And even like um, a book that you've read many times, then you almost go more fully deeply into that flow state so much that you might not even hear a car backfire, mm. you know, on the street, really, you know, it'll be an object to which an awareness is not apprehended, you know, it'll be this kind of like passive indirect attention, but you're so much absorbed, nothing else is really present. So this, the interesting thing about this is that for negative states of mind like anger, they can become very, very habitual, so much so that they just pop up without effort, like you see a certain kind of person or they say a certain kind of thing, you're just angry without any kind of preparation, right, without any warning, you're just angry. But that doesn't mean you have like a realization of anger. You can't have a realization of a negative state of mind because negative states of mind are not in accordance with reality. So they can become so firmly habituated is as if you have a realization of anger or a realization of laziness or something, but it's actually just strong conditioning and it can always be overcome. Whereas a realization of something like loving kindness or compassion after a certain point on the path, you can't slide back. You couldn't unlearn it if you tried. Early in the piece you can, but after a fashion, there's no backsliding from those realizations. So that's really good news. Yeah, other, other thoughts so far? More? More. Okay. Okay, so this is a good example. Um, the primary consciousness is like main light in a room while its accompanying mental factors are like other lights in the same room. While each light is distinct, they blend together to illuminate the room. The fact that an auditory primary consciousness is present means that all its accompanying mental factors also perceive sound. If the mental factor of feeling experiences pleasure, then the entire mental state is pleasurable. So just this is an interesting way of framing it. So the primary consciousness is like the main light. The other mental factors also illuminate, but they're not the main one. So when we look at these five sensory ones, these are just what you understand from you know, basic biology, but we're not talking about the organs. We're talking about the consciousnesses that kind of live in the organs which are subtle form, and then the consciousness itself. So there's a few different things happening when we look at these. But basically, if you go back to um, the omnipresent mental factor of contact, what you have is uh, outside 
object, you have an organ, you have a sense power, and you have a sense consciousness all coming together to have the experience of something like sight or something like sound. So of course, these things are reliant on the organs in order to function fully. But even if you have a malfunctioning organ, like say you're someone who is deaf, it doesn't mean you don't have auditory primary consciousness. It's just not able to function in the same way. So since consciousnesses directly perceive their objects, while thought apprehends its object in an indirect way by means of negation. When we think about yellow, the opposite of non-yellow appears in our mind. This is the conceptual appearance of yellow. So it's like by process of elimination, all of the non-yellows disappear until the opposite of non-yellow appears. And then we're you know, having some sort of thought about yellow and describing it as yellow. But the eye just saw yellow without knowing what yellow was. The mental factors had to talk to it about yellow through process of elimination. It's weird. So a conceptual consciousness does not know its object directly, but knows it through a negative process. So then reliable sense consciousnesses correctly and directly perceive their object. They see color and shape, hear sounds and so forth. Based on these direct perceivers, we then think about and remember objects. These are conceptual consciousnesses. Thought is conceptual. It does not know its object clearly, but only via a conceptual appearance of the object appearing to the mind. This is this generic image or meaning generality sometimes translated as. Dharmakirti says, whatsoever consciousness has clear appearance is asserted to be non-conceptual. A direct perceiver sees the building, conceptual consciousness, plans its construction, right? So that's a, that's a good way of understanding it. Direct perception is seeing the building as a whole, conceptual consciousness plan its construction or see the windows and doors like that. So this is what we were talking about way back in week one about what is reliable or valid cognition and direct reliable cognizers are perceptual and they apprehend manifest phenomena. Factual reliable cognizers apprehend slightly obscure or hidden phenomena. Inferential reliable cognizers by authoritative testimony for ordinary beings apprehend very obscure or extremely hidden phenomena. So these categories are described in relation to ordinary sentient beings, not arias. For an aria or someone who's realized emptiness perceptually, subtle impermanence and selflessness are evident or manifest. Whereas for us, they are slightly obscure. There are no obscure objects for Buddhas because they are omniscience. Even in terms of other ordinary sentient beings, there's variation. So we talk about these things, manifest phenomena, those things that are obvious, hidden phenomena, things like emptiness, and extremely hidden phenomena, things like karma cause and effect. And it sounds like they are manifest hidden and or extremely hidden in and of themselves, but they're only hidden by the mind perceiving them. Yeah, or conceiving them. It's the mind coming to those objects that has a level of directness or not. So for a Buddha, they're able to see what we see, what we hear, what we understand, while at the same time understanding the emptiness of inherent existence, while at the same time understanding the whole spectrum of cause and effect and all of its kind of variations and you know history over time. For us, we just see manifest phenomena. And if we want to realize emptiness, it's something that starts hidden and then we meditate on it with thought, with conception, with logic, again and again and again, and it gets less and less hidden for us. Karma and all of its nuances is something that is too complex. There are too many variables for an ordinary sentient being's mind to hold. Even one who's realized emptiness can only see some karma. You have to be fully omniscient 
to see all karma. And part of the reason we want omniscience is to be able to see all karma of sentient beings so we can know precisely what's going to help. Otherwise, up until that point, it's an educated guess. You know, we could be helpful, but we might actually make things worse because we don't have the full spectrum of clarity that a Buddha does in order to understand, actually, karmically speaking, this activity is going to bring them to enlightenment quicker than that activity. So I'll encourage this one as opposed to that one. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so then, of course, the question arises, why do we need to become a Buddha if there are already Buddhas? Are they just sitting on their laurels or they're not helping? They're just kind of waiting, right? And of course, the degree to which Buddhas can assist us is dependent on our karma and dependent on our karmic connection with them. And so it's for the sake of people that we have strong karmic connection with that we need to become enlightened because they may only be able to hear teachings from us. Yeah, in the same way as like everyday advice, some random stranger tells you, hey, here's a cool financial planner. You say, all right, whatever. But if your best friend tells you, hey, there's a good financial planner, you'll say, oh, okay, I'll follow up. You know, same advice, the source matters. So we have to become enlightened for the people in our life right now that we have this strong karmic connection with. They'll be our first disciples or we will be theirs, <laughs> depending on who gets there first. So if you kind of have this sense of, I need to practice in such a way that my positive states of mind become direct and perceptual all the way to enlightenment, because in that way, I'm gonna definitely be of benefit in an expansive, unmistaken way. It's not like we have to wait until then to be useful. It's just that our effectiveness is not as vast as it could be. So any um, sort of final consciousness questions or thoughts or ideas before we stretch and meditate? Someone sent an email about uh, the consciousness at the time of death. Is that person in the room? Send me an emoji. No? <laughs> oh, yes, okay. So, um, the consciousness at the time of death is the most subtle consciousness that we experience at our stage. And the idea is that basically your sensory consciousnesses that I just talked about have kind of absorbed or dissolved or no longer support in the same way, which means you're less distracted naturally without effort. So if you think about your normal meditation, your first distractions are usually sensory, and then your distractions become mental, right? On a good day, you get past the senses to the mental. At the time of death, you naturally withdraw from the coarse consciousnesses, the coarse sensory consciousnesses, so you don't have to worry about them being distracting. And the fundamental mind becomes manifest um, and you can use that to then go on and realize emptiness or bodhicitta or whatever you've previously conditioned your mind to do. So that's, you know, a long conversation, but just kind of the short synopsis. Yeah, please ask follow up. Well, I'm just curious, like if, if you tap someone on the top of their head, right before they die, will that actually help their consciousness to be, I mean, sorry, I'm I know a poet is a very complicated thing, but this is just a very simple, simple question. Um, can't hurt. <laughs> can't hurt. Um, okay. You know, there's in the Lam Rim, it talks about if the consciousness leaves through the crown or through the heart, it's very auspicious. If the consciousness leaves lower, it's less auspicious. Mm -hmm. So if you have to move the body to tap the crown or to tap the heart before you move the body, can kind of direct the consciousness to exit in the most helpful way, possibly. Um, the most important thing are the moments before that. Yeah, did they launch their death process with a positive, peaceful mind? And also mm -hmm. if they didn't, it's not the end of the world because they also have the bardo experience, the intermediate state. And in that state, they have a level of clairvoyance. And so you can be reminding them of their practice through your thoughts in the time after their death. So even if it was a rough end or a not auspicious end, you don't have to feel like it's a failure. Yeah, because there's still time in the bardo. 
And even if in the bardo, nothing good came about, even if they go straight to the worst of the worst, nothing is forever, nothing is doomed, nothing is fated, they're not gonna be there forever. They're gonna exhaust their negative karma and pop on out again. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate sure. it. All right, so let's have a five minute break and then a little meditation.
Okay, come on back. Were there any um, final questions before we do our meditation? Yes, Athanara. Um, you, you just talk, uh, say something about karma and uh, realization and uh, to say, like to have omniscience to help other people. Uh, mm, like a, a, a karmic connection between you and some people that you love or a karmic connection between you and some people that you not hate but dislike is it is it the same like yeah yeah um strong karma is strong karma whether positive or negative, there's a very famous Lama Yeshi quote that a bad connection is better than no connection in terms of being able to benefit sentient beings. <laughs> so um, you might as well work for the benefit of those that you have problems with because you have bumped into them before, you will bump into them again. Yes. Yes, I, I thought about this uh, subject <laughs> a lot. Thank you. Yeah. And who's to say that the difficult ones aren't actually the Buddhas and that the sweet ones that are your friends are just regular ordinary beings and uh, the problematic ones are the Buddhas manifesting to give us some uh, fuel, <laughs> something to come up against. They say that uh, bodhisattvas, because they're so beautiful to be around, they're so kind, they're so loving, that they have so few difficulties, they have so few problematic relationships, that sometimes they're like, well, how am I going to practice patience if no one is terrible to me? Right? And they're like looking for difficult people. We probably don't have that problem yet, but uh, someday we'll have that kind of problem. Not enough difficult people in our life. Yeah, any other questions? Thank you. Um, you know, related to the Buddhahood question, basically, in terms of the mind, once you have kind of realized emptiness directly, you start working on getting rid of afflictive obscurations, which prevent liberation. And then once you start really getting rid of those, the final grounds of a bodhisattva, you get rid of cognitive obscurations, which are what prevent full awakening. So like the latencies of ignorance and the dualistic views they give rise to. So the common analogy is like uh, the negative karma is like garlic and then you take the garlic out, but you still have the smell. Yeah, so the negative karmic seeds are like the garlic, the imprints are like the smell. And then a Buddha has no stinky, no stinky left, <laughs> right? All clean, right? Or nothing obscuring their ability to benefit. Yeah, any, anything else before we sit? Okay, we shall sit. <clears throat> so come back to a stable meditation posture. You're back as aligned as it can be. Or imagine it into alignment. A few intentional breaths to let your body and your nervous system calm. and scan from the crown of your head down to the tip of your toes and back up again, gently down and up, allowing any areas of tension to release and relax, inviting balance to your body.
And as the body starts to settle, gradually shift your focus to the breath. You can focus at the belly where the air makes the stomach rise and fall, or you can focus at the nostrils where you feel the air pass. So just choose one location to settle your focus and just be with the breath intentionally. Try to just know the breath. Give it your interest. Direct your attention there. Other things arise, you choose not to follow them. And as the surface distractions settle, now invite your conceptual mind to articulate your motivation. In words, remind yourself of why we meditate, why we study and practice. And so think something like, the purpose of my life is to free sentient beings from suffering is to bring them happiness. In order to do this, I must understand suffering and happiness within myself, diminishing the one, strengthening the other. To that end, I meditate on the mind. May the knowledge and experience from these meditations lead to me developing my mind to its utmost extent for the benefit of all living beings. So some words of bodhicitta to yourself, waking it up, bringing it forefront. And so with that motivation, now turn to an observational mind that is aware of your conceptual thought, that is aware of your mental factors. 
that is not obsessed with them or invested in them. A mind that watches the weather of the mind, the clouds coming and going, not fixating, not agreeing or disagreeing. Just watch your own thoughts. Watch your thoughts the way you might watch a movie that you're mildly interested in, but not one that you're obsessed with the plot. Just observational, not judgmental. If the thoughts are very verbal, you simply know that. If the thoughts are very quiet, you simply know that. If the thoughts are accompanied by various mental images or sounds, you simply know that. Not pushing any aside, not chasing any, just watch. Like you were lying in the grass, staring at the sky, seeing the clouds shift. Not needing them to form into pictures, not needing them to make sense. watching.
and then move from a passive watching to a choosing of one of the mental factors to be more organized with. Choose mental attention, mental engagement, and allow mental engagement to settle its attention on the mind itself. So using one mental factor, think that you're observing the main mind, the primary mental consciousness, like the sky itself, reflective and expansive. Not adding any commentary, not needing discernment to say anything to you. Just shift your object of meditation from the mental factors to the main mind using just one mental factor to do that observation. The others keep operating, but you're not interested in them right now. Sky, not clouds. And whenever it feels like you're falling into the clouds or getting all amongst the mental factors, imagine yourself pulling out of that weather, pulling out of that mental activity and returning your attention to the expansiveness, spacious, reflective, And think this spacious clarity, this reflective expanse, this place of peace is always available, always exists, even during the worst weather. I can bring my focus like an airplane through the clouds up above it all. setting my mind in natural great peace.
and bring your attention back to your body, aware of your weight in the seat, aware of the strength of your spine, at home in your own skin. Aware of your lungs breathing, your heart beating. And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Okay, so you can relax your attention. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, thanks very much to Land of Medicine Buddha for hosting this series. And this is my last class with Land of Medicine Buddha for this year. But I hope to be back in the United States and back in California, um, probably September. So I'll see you around the internet or I'll see you in person. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank you, Venerable, for the wonderful class. I will miss you, Venerable. <laughs> Thank was, you. I will look for you on the internet. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, Is it on the so are your classes on your website? Um, I'm doing mostly private classes the next few months and then retreat, but um uh august or september i'll be kind of more active online again but uh, mostly the classes will be private although i think shanti davis study group israel will be publishing the classes after the fact um, next month so shanti davis study group israel they have a great youtube channel so stay tuned for uploads <laughs> thanks guys thank you thank have you. a wonderful retreat thank, thank you, you. Thank you.